Thank you for downloading the Start the Week podcast from BBC Radio 4. For more information, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. Freedom. We blather on endlessly about it, but do we, can we actually have it? What does it mean? Later on, I'm going to be talking to Jonathan Franzen, author of Freedom. Hailed as a great American novel, but making headlines over the past few days when it was withdrawn for corrections. A non-final draft had been published by mistake, and since the novel which made Jonathan Franzen globally famous was The Corrections, the newspapers were agape. We'll find out more about that. But I really want to concentrate today on the idea of freedom. Sheila Stevenson's new play, Enlightenment, is about a couple trapped in time by the possible death of their son by Islamist terrorists. It's also a play about terrible liars. Robert Douglas Fairhurst has cre- uh, edited a new edition of the great Henry Mayhew's London Labour and the London Poet, which is still a gripping account of lives pinched and deformed by the pressures of staying alive. Not much freedom for them. And the philosopher Barry Smith challenges the very notion of an autonomous, free consciousness making its own decisions in his new radio series on philosophy and neuroscience. Sheila Stevenson, let's start then with this play, um, which is about uh, a relatively ordinary middle-class mm. couple to whom something extraordinary and terrible happened. Yeah, it's about a pretty ordinary, comfortable middle-class couple whose son goes off on a gap year. So there's this enormous freedom to travel the world that kids have now, which we didn't have when we were young. Off, off around the world, there has been a bomb in Jakarta six months ago. They haven't heard from him since. So they guess he's probably been blown up in the bomb, but as there's no trace of him, they don't know. So the play is actually about people being trapped in a moment, but with no... No way no, of going forward. They no. can't go forward and they don't know where he is and they feel they're never going to find him. I don't want to give him. away the whole play, but somebody <laughs> turns out who they think is their son, well, might well, be they, their son. They, they get a message that they found their son and that's the hinge of the play, which is at the end of Act One. But the problem with the play in terms of talking about it is that it, it's, you don't want to it's give actually it a thriller. It works as a thriller. Although right. it's actually quite, it's more complicated than that, obviously. Well, we'll do our very best not to, not to spoil yeah. it for anybody. Um, how complicated was it to create a play in which... Everybody is talking, but everybody is at least potentially lying as well. Difficult for the audience. Or, I mean, the, the, yeah. in terms of sort of people's idea of what the characters really are like slips constantly. Yeah, I mean, one of the characters is, um, a, a, well, she calls herself a sensitive, I suppose. she's We might call her a clairvoyant or a medium. And I personally don't believe in mediums, so I've made it so that everything she says she can actually pick up from what they're giving her. I think she believes what she's saying, though, if you see what I mean. I don't think she thinks she's lying. I think she actually believes that she's in touch with the other world or something. Everybody's trying to create stories, create yes. narratives, whether it's the main couple yeah. trying to make a story which fits, uh, m- makes a sort of tolerable reality for them about their missing son. Yeah, because I think that... I mean, I've, I've said before, I think human beings are hardwired for narratives so that you, you give us a situation, you give us a blank piece of paper, and what we say is... What does this mean? What's going on here? What's the story? And they have no story about their son, so what they're trying to do is create a story that makes some sort of sense. But all the stories they come, they invent slip away from them because none of them are... There's no facts for them. No facts for them. And then trying to impose a new kind of narrative on it all, there's a very bumptious, uh, intrusive television yes, producer. Yes. You're clearly quite critical of this sort of genre of television docu-drama or uh, reality documentary. It's also because <laughs> because I've been interviewed by people before where you sit down and have an interview and to, ostensibly to talk about a play and the first thing they say always is, hello, Sheila, how old are you? Which <laughs> is completely throwing because you think... What on earth's that got to do with anything? But they're quite particular about it. And they do say, don't worry, I'll look it up. So they start off on a very, very personal level. So it's basically me just getting back at people who've been rude to me in interviews, really. Um, but they are... The, the, interview, the television woman in this thing is, is ghastly, really. Ghastly. And it's, it's also, again, about telling stories um, and creating fi- fictitious stories because in these kinds of television... Um, uh, docudramas or whatever you call them 
we're constantly told that so-and-so is on their own or we're given yeah. an authentic meeting between two people bursting into tears. And in fact, people are never on their own because there's always an entire television crew yeah. there. And people, if they've been bursting into tears, they've done it several times for different angles. And, and what she does know. say at one point, maybe we could do a reconstruction later when you're, a bit, you know, later mm. on when it's a bit easier for you. Um, so she's... Um, well, she... I think that those people don't start off like that. I think the nature of the work they do makes them like that. Thinking about freedom yeah. and reading your play, I came to the conclusion that your notion was that while we may think we have freedom, we are all of us most of the time trapped in st inside stories that we are constantly writing and over which we don't have control. Yes, and I also think we're trapped because we don't understand the the fact that the world is terrible is interconnected and much more so than it was before. We don't know what effects things on the other side of the world are having on us at any given moment because we only live in our own little personal bubble. So what did the the, the rest of us make of this? I was interested in that notion of the freedom of telling stories in the theatre as opposed to, to television. Uh, there's that wonderful opening image of the bouncing tennis balls yeah. which gradually become more and more out of sync. It reminded me of that line in The Duchess of Malfi, we are merely the star's tennis balls struck and banded which way please them. But, of course, here it's not fate, it's physics, isn't it? It's those, those yeah. tiny, ungovernable forces that make it impossible to know exactly what's going to happen. And I wondered, what about the theatre? Is, is that why you're attracted to, to these ideas in the theatre? Because the theatre always allows the same set of events to have a slightly different outcome. Yeah, but I think I'm just quite interested in science, really, because I don't really know anything about science, so it's it's a territory I'm interested in. But it is very interesting that um, sort of quantum mechanics and Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, yeah. that all of that have infected um, fiction, yeah. drama, storytelling, and are now as important to us as the old sort of optimistic um, progress... Yeah. Um, whiggish ideas that used to infect things. I mean, you call the play Enlightenment, but it's an ironic title. It's an ironic title, though it is about a form of enlightenment, not an 18th century form of enlightenment. Barry? Yeah, no, I'm interested that at the end of the play you've got somebody who's rather sceptical about enlightenment. She's sceptical about uh, the woman who's, whose life she's been reading about and thinking about, who's searching for peace, wanted enlightenment, and now she says... Well, it's really not like that. We can't make sense of things in a rational way. We actually realise there are a lot of contingencies, there are a lot of sort of separate facts, and they all somehow just have to be born rather than made into a intelligible separate story. And and that seems to be part of the play, is the idea that there's something very familiar, very comfortable, and it feels as though it's inevitable, and then suddenly it's rendered apart. You know, you tear away the surface, and something enters their lives that make them feel what was so familiar is actually very, very fragile and very vulnerable. Yes, but I, I think that she does reach a form of enlightenment, and it's an enlightenment of acceptance. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned, um, Robert mentioned earlier on uh, Webster's Duchess of Malfi. I'll throw at you another uh, Jacobean, um, Middleton. This is also a play about a changeling, isn't it? Yes. Someone, who, someone who comes in from outside and is the cuckoo in the nest. And that is... Um, it, I, I'm interested in how... Um, not just Shakespeare, but the Jacobeans still hang over quite a lot of our... You, ca you can't quite get away from their influence anywhere, can you? Because their stories are so great. I mean, even Pinter, yeah. because it's to do with people coming in from the outside, uninvited. Well, let's move to um, another uh, great, great writer, um, Henry Mayhew, whose London um, Lives and the London Poor is one of the, the great Victorian works. Um, up there with early Dickens and certainly with Thackeray and all the rest of it. Uh, Robert Douglas Fairhurst, you've edited this new edition, a very attractive new edition with lots of nice pictures and stuff in it as well, um, of the, the great book. Um, and you, in, in your introduction, you paint a portrait of Henry Mayhew. I had no idea what Henry Mayhew was really like. And he's not an entirely admirable figure, is he? No, I mean, there were many Mayhews. The problem that we have in trying to pin him down is that lots of different Mayhews inhabited the same skin uh, and sort of fought for space uh, and fought for people's attention. Mm. Uh, there was the, uh, the establishment man, the sober man who wanted to divide the world up into nice, orderly categories. Uh, there was the maverick, the outsider, uh, who took pleasure in those quirky little details, uh, the eccentric 
individuals. Um, the problem we've got in trying to pin him down is that he couldn't quite do it himself. He spent most of the first half of his life flitting from one thing to the next, never really settling on anything. Uh, he was born in 1812, which we now associate with overtures. Most <laughs> of his life was, was a series of overtures, a series of false starts that fizzled out. He started off being you know, an editor, a journalist, uh, a playwright, uh, a novelist. Uh, he tried almost everything. He failed at almost everything. And it was only when he was asked to uh, write a letter for the Morning Chronicle, a liberal campaigning newspaper, in 1849 that he found some kind of direction for himself. And what is wonderful about this is the immediacy and the sort of stench of the street with the ham sandwich sellers and the one-legged Italians and the vagrants and the rat catchers and the dog collar sellers and all the rest of it. But it struck me that Victorian London, um, a sort of pullulating, very, very unfair place with not much freedom for people um, who didn't have a lot of money... Um, was nonetheless uh, sort of varied and colourful in a way that London isn't anymore or any great city isn't anymore because there were simply more trades and more varieties of humanity. No, that's absolutely right. Um, one of the oddities of the book is that, or the work as, as, it, as it evolved, as it mushroomed out of control, was that it reflected an economy in which people were trying to find some kind of niche for themselves uh, and that, of course, meant that they had to to diversify, to specialise, to find something increasingly specific within an increasingly complex and. You know, and what I what I was also struck by is the sort of arc of Henry Mayhew's life. So he's this work is wonderful. Most of it, at any rate, is wonderful early reportage, going out actually. Uh, reporting what he sees and writing in a very, very <coughs> vivid way so you get the voices and smells of the streets, which is like early Dickens. And then later in his career, he has this Victorian urge to moralise and sentimentalise everything. Again, you think of Dickens a bit. And I don't wonder what there was that created that arc at that period, because you can look at Thackeray, you can look at Dickens, you can look at one of my great favourites is the, the, the newspaper man, George Augustus Sala, so like Henry Mayhew, and again ends up as a sort of pompous moraliser. What was it about the, about Victorian life that turned them all in, turned them all bad? It's a it's a good question. I mean, he starts off with London Labour and the London Poor writing something close to a huge Victorian novel without a plot. It's full of characters and details. This extraordinary kaleidoscopic uh, picture of ordinary life but without any sense of any kind of organising drive, any purpose, any, any, any end in sight. The only thing that links it all together is Mayhew himself. And in fact, one of the reasons he was so attracted to these, these ne'er-do-wells, these, these lowlifes, is that he was so terrified of becoming one himself. He was only ever a few pounds away from slipping through the cracks of respectability into this and once world. Res and once respectability happens, maybe that's when mm. the sentimentalising happens right. along... Uh, sorry, I've just been slipped in there. The BBC, I, I, should, I should read this out. BBC would like to apologise to lovers of late Dickens novels uh, for any suggestion that they are terrible or bad. Um, this is not corporation policy. I'm sorry about that. Um, what did the rest of us make of... What were the rest of them? Uh, Barry Smith. Yes, I'm, I'm interested in several of the things that we get out of this fascinating detail. We know, we know what people ate and drank. We know all the different jobs and trades. But it's his attention to language that's really fascinating. I mean, he's, he takes a long time decomposing what he thinks are the, the rules that make the special street argo that people use to disguise their talk and their meaning from the police. And he tells you that they reverse um, the first and second syllables of words. And that's fascinating because in contemporary Paris now, in the banlieue, they do exactly mm -hmm. the same. Mm. They take the word femme and make it mef. And, uh, you know, is this a universal of language? It's very strange. But... On Mayhew himself, I'm very puzzled because this is a guy who's writing about the dispossessed, the cheated of sunlight, you know, people down there at the very lowest strata of society. But he was also the editor of Punch, very different milieu. And I just wonder how you walk between those, those two different lives. Well, he was kicked out of Punch after only a short uh, time as, as the editor. Um, you do get a sense of humour. You get a sense of uh, that same drive for, for stories and for slightly cartoonish uh, caricatures of, uh, of people, which, uh, which obviously you get in Early Punch. You get that too in, in London Labour and London Poor. 
I mean, if one thing joins them together, perhaps it's uh, it's this interest in in the occult, in the secret, in the strange, in in the hidden world that a lot of satire involves trying to unpick what people mm. would normally take for granted, uh, and seeing the the, the opposite side, uh, surface and below. I, ex- exactly, and when Gissing talks about the netherworld. Uh, and when uh, Mayhew talks about the undiscovered country of the poor, they're talking about the same thing. It's not this this world which is is strange because it's so far away. It's it's strange precisely because it is so so close to us. It's just that we it's been beneath our notice. Sheila Stevenson. I think what I found extraordinary about it was that he um, all this exposure to the poor in London, and it was extraordinary the deprivation, absolutely extraordinary. But it had no effect on his social conscience whatsoever. If um, if someone was doing this now, it would be a, a not a very good documentary because it would be quite short and it wouldn't be as wonderful as this. But it would be with the purpose of saying this is dreadful and something must be done. That is interesting. He has no answer to no. any of this. He is simply an eye roving around and telling you stories. I mean, it's completely different from uh, Booth doing his great survey of the London poor or um, Roundtree doing his book on poverty or indeed Karl Marx and Engels. I mean, bad or good, they've all got solutions of one kind or another. He doesn't, and he doesn't seem to be interested. He's a lot more like Boz than he is like Booth. He's much Mm. more interested in being this roving consciousness. Uh, And you're right, he's not a theorist like Engels, he's not a reformer uh, like Booth. Uh, But if we talk about the the, uh, the building of the welfare state. He's part of the foundations. He's, he's a necessary... Yes. He, he, he raises money, but he also raises consciousness. He raises awareness. He's, I mean, he's not a theorist, but he's almost a, an ontologist, a sort of metaphysician of, of social strata, because he, he's got these categories, and he believes that they're exclusive and exhaustive. And he's very careful about dividing everybody up into their role, into their strata. He reminds me a little bit of New Society back in the 1970s, if anyone remembers that magazine, when they used to go out and they used to have lots and lots yeah. of straight reporting. I mean, there was, the, there was the sort of politics on one side, but there was the straight reporting. And it was also a London which was just drunk on words, wasn't it? I mean, I mean I, I, almost like, we're talking about the Elizabethans and Jacobeans, in the same way, this is a society drunk on print. Well, the categories uh, which you're talking about are, are extraordinary because the, the, the more he tries to divide the world up, the more it starts to slip away from his control. It's like a jigsaw puzzle mm-hmm. with an infinite number of pieces, mm-hmm. but there's no picture. There's no picture that emerges, which means that every time he tries to divide people up into those that can work, those that cannot work, those that will not work, his eye is instantly drawn, first of all, to those who slip between the cracks, and secondly, to those picturesque individuals like the man who's terrified that he won't be able to join the army because he's going bold, you know, <laughs> who, who are not part of a statistically significant But are just much proportion. more interesting. But are much more, more fun and much read. more interesting. Yes. Counterexamples, always looking for the counterexample. Absolutely. Um, well, this takes us very, very neatly on to, to Barry Smith's um, wonderful um, series on um, neuroscience and philosophy, which is going out on the World Service, actually. The World Service, World, yes. world Service. Uh, educating the world in these matters and I, I suppose the first place uh, we were talking about things slipping away from us um, and the underlying theme of the series seems to me to be um, s- that our very notions of self uh, and autonomy and consciousness slip away um, when you start to investigate them um, with the insight of the latest breakthroughs in neuroscience and in making this series you spend quite a lot of time looking at brain damage of one kind or another mm. just start by explaining to us why for a philosopher brain damage and brain problems are so interesting i think they're interesting because you you think as a philosopher and lots of lots of philosophers certainly have said this that you know the starting point is our own experience this is the thing we know best we know ourselves best we might wonder whether our picture of the world is right but you know the contents of our own mind descartes thought were so well lit, so well kind of uh, documented to us that there was there were no shadows in the, which anything the, escaped our notice. We saw everything. And the one thing, Descartes, said, that you can rely on is, is what you th- is, is what you... is 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 your thought and your experience exactly what's in your mind. And of course, this turns out to be largely false. I mean, uh, we are as mistaken about our own experience as our experience sometimes gives us mistakes about the world around us. And it's neuroscience, and it's often looking at patients with neurological damage that brings this to light because we realize that something that looks simple, familiar, uh, very easy to comprehend is in fact composite. It's got a number of different parts and it's sustained by different neurological systems that have to cooperate to produce a single feeling of an integrated experience. If any one of those goes wrong, the experience is radically different. So there isn't 
uh, autonomous taste that's different from sight and different from smell and up to a point even from hearing. No, taste is a taste is a really good case. In fact, that's what got me into this as a philosopher, because we think of taste as what we get from the sensations on the tongue. In fact, that's it's nothing like that. Taste is always an amalgam of taste, touch, and smell. Probably you're using sight and hearing as well to give you the sense of of, of what you're enjoying. I mean. Most people who lose their sense of smell report to the doctor they've lost their taste. And when they're examined, they have salt, sweet, sour, bitter. So you say to them, look, you haven't lost the ta- your taste. And they say, yeah, but that's all I get. That shows you that about 80% of everything else is smell. Now, that means that our own experience as we examine it doesn't give us clues as to how it works, where it comes from, and what it's based on. Mm. And what about, as it were, the higher integrated levels of consciousness? Well, I think when we're looking at decision-making, we have a view of ourselves as conscious choosing agents. We've got our freedom, we decide what to do, and then we instruct the the, the limbs, and then we move. In fact, it's not like that. We start to make preparations for movements many seconds before we ourselves know what we've consciously chosen to do. In fact, I looked at a a study with uh, John Dylan Haynes in Berlin. He asked people to choose to press a button left or right at will, just make their own choice. And he can tell by scanning them repeatedly seven seconds in advance. Seven seconds. Seven That's seconds in advance, which, which way they're going to go with 100% reliability. And so in our daily life, we, we, we think we're moving through the day, brushing our teeth and getting dressed and going out and getting buses or whatever we're doing. And the story that we are telling ourselves is that we think about something and then do it. But this is an untrue story. We don't have that kind of freedom. Well, there's a question for the philosopher about whether we do have freedom. We, we, we don't have the freedom we think we have, namely consciously deciding and choosing and putting everything into operation. It doesn't mean we're not free. It just means that the bits of us that decide are not the conscious bits, that we're already starting to make decisions. Very often what you say to yourself that you're deciding is a bit of self-PR. You've already actually started to move in a certain direction and then you catch up and you narrate it. So we have this tendency to put our own experience together into a certain form that's very familiar and very convenient. And when you look at the cases of people with neurological damage and you see how this goes awry, so sometimes they feel their arm is under the control of someone else, that it moves of its own, its own will. Sometimes they feel their arm isn't even theirs. You realize that you need all of these parts collaborating and cooperating to give us that familiar sense of self and agency and self-control. And just before we open this up, um, another very important component of this a simple sort of biological questions like the quantity of dopamine and the extent to which one is thirsty um, affect very much consciousness. And, and affect decision making. In and fact, you have, a, you have a suite of decision making systems. You've got the very high level one where you think you're reasoning and weighing everything up. And then you've got much more basic sort of Pavlovian systems where you're drawn to something that motivates you in the landscape around you. And actually, being a good reasoner isn't living at the high level. Being a good reasoner is being able to switch appropriately to use the right system in the right time and in the right context. I was interested in this process of mirroring, which you talk Mm. about in one of your programmes, the way in which the same parts of my brain will fire up if I see someone else doing something. Um, I was wondering how neuroscience then might explain something like the different responses to pornography, in which... Uh, One person might feel desire, one might feel disgust, and another might feel some rather uncertain, queasy mixture of the two. Uh, Is it that different people's brains are wired differently? Is it that uh, there is some kind of moral sense which might master, might overwhelm the other senses? How how does that work? So the mirror system's interesting because there you've got neurons that fire when you perform an action or you see somebody else perform. Monkey say, monkey do neurons, as we call them. But these neurons also give you a sense of empathy. So when you smile, I find myself smiling, and then I have some of the same feelings inside. And you wonder, well, if this happens so automatically, neural mimicry, why don't we empathize with everybody all the time? And the answer is we sort of do at a low level, but we actually veto that. There are various controlling factors that kind of cut off our tendency to feel with other people so readily. Sheila Stevenson. Well, I was I was also fascinated in this mirroring thing, but what because I've got a nastier mind, I suppose. What interested me was I thought, what about the opposite? If it makes you... Is it just empathy? Or is it an explanation of why... The idea that you can be... That you pick up disgust from people. But you, could that mean you could 
mirror someone's disgust for an entire section of humanity. You, you can mirror disgust, and disgust is very interesting because here's a very basic low-level system where, you know, if you see somebody smelling something and wincing, you feel a sense of disgust. But that disgust, that, that sense of tuning into someone else gets modulated and in fact you start to metaphorize it so you start to talk about certain groups of people as disgusting you start exactly, to talk about certain behavior as disgusting you move out but you're mobilizing these really very elementary processes mm -hmm. and because of contagion emotional contagion you actually can get yourself into a state that was not of your choosing does it have to be real people i mean what, what if i watch a um a, a violent computer game am i likely to mirror Yes, Those because responses. exactly because it's animate, and we look at agency, and the brain is drawn to agency straight away. I'm not sure whether we can discuss it on the radio, but there is a there is a moment in Jonathan Franzen's uh, new novel which certainly will produce an, uh, extreme feelings of disgust um, uh, among people reading it, I think. I should say, Jonathan Ransom just joined us. His freedom to come here at the beginning of the programme was violated uh, by the <laughs> London Tube Stripe, so uh, it's very good that he's, he's made it at the end. Um, the theme uh, of the programme has been freedom, and the book is called Freedom. It's already been hailed as a great American novel. Uh, I have to say, making headlines over the last few days because it was withdrawn for corrections, and since Jonathan Franzen's last uh, global success was called Corrections, lots of people said this is very strange and very bizarre. Um, John, I must start by asking you, it's, it isn't some kind of PR stunt, this? I mean, there the really were corrections that needed to be dealt with. Uh, no, no PR stunt, and apparently uh, not a PR stunt that... that caused my car not to materialize this morning either <laughs> highlighting the london tube strike um <clears throat> no 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 uh, everyone is tearing their hair at the publisher and i've read the book we've all read the book but have we have we how much have we read the wrong book as it were uh what was read was was what all the uh, editors and uh, book reviewers got so it's not it's not really deeply different but i made maybe 250 changes that were important to me and <laughs> that's quite a lot of changes important yes. enough to to uh, prompt a total recall um you've called this book freedom and it's the story of uh, an american family um rather like Sheila Stevenson's play an on the surface relatively normal midwestern family um, whose lives unravel um, in all sorts of ways. And we won't, again, we won't go through the story because it spoils it for people who are going to read it later on. But um, suffice it to say that um, this is a, it seems to me to be a book in which people are constantly creating their own narratives, um, writing their own stories, as it were, in their heads, and indeed in the central case of the book, writing her own narrative as part of psychotherapy. Uh, well, yes, and and I I do uphold the narrative tradition. Listening to Barry, I was I was trying to think about some of the decisions that are made in the book, and there is one character who who essentially takes exactly the line that the decision is made, and the decision is made in his pants, and mm -hmm. and his conscious faculties trot along afterwards. The, he describes. One part of himself knowing long before the rest of him does what he's going to do. Uh, at the same time, you do have other characters who are uh, inhabiting... He, he's the rocker, and, and he would think that. There are other characters who are inhabiting a, a much more complicated moral world, and, and there the decisions are stretching over years. And, and that's when you get into the strength of narrative and, to my mind, the weakness of neuroscience in helping explain us to ourselves. Um, well, you have a, I mean, as often in a novel, one of the most interesting um, and, and complicated characters is um, somebody, Walter, who wants to be good, who, who thinks of himself as a good man with, with very strong environmental and liberal principles. And one is constantly questioning throughout this novel because, he, in some respects, he is sort of physically rather a weak man um, or in, 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 he's certainly not as impressive um, as his friend the rocker and one wonders the extent to which um, people use uh, an idea of themselves as the good person the thinker the intellectual to compensate for other problems they've got well he's he's not a completely unattractive man uh, I, I think he's 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 a nice person because people who grow up in the Midwest uh, in a certain kind of family have niceness inculcated into them. But like a lot of Americans on both the left and the right in the last decade, he becomes extremely angry 
Uh, and and at, at one point, he is, he is, in fact, liberated to try to do something about the things that make him angry. He's, he's given essentially $100 million by a very rich man to try to fix these things. He's previously only been able to get angry about. It's, it's an environmental project um, him, yes. in West Virginia, yes. kind of place I know. Um, and you, you mentioned anger because that's, that, that's another interesting theme and it's a big issue in American politics, and at certain times it washes over here as well. The sheer quantity of only vaguely directed anger seems to be sluicing around the American political and media world, probably accelerated by uh, the Internet and new technology. I don't know. But everybody seems to be so angry all of the time, and I wonder why you think that is. Uh, well, there are complicated reasons, but uh, certainly one of the one of the theories that that crops up in in my book is that uh, people who come over to a land to be free and and encounter these these absolute limits to their freedom. Um, you know, we have no more Wild West, and we also no longer have the hegemonic position in the same way we did 50 years ago. And and you've been promised all your life, oh, you can do whatever you want. You're free to invent yourself in whatever ways you like, and you, you come up against the limits, and everybody gets very angry. Uh, particularly on the right, uh, because there's a sort of, you know, don't touch me, let me carry my gun, let me drive at high speeds uh, on the wide open roads. And the roads aren't wide open anymore because the country's clogging up with people and uh, in an ever-deepening economic crisis. Mm. You clearly have great ambitions for the novel as, as a form. And one of the things that we expect from a big novel... Um, is that it raises some uncomfortable big issues that aren't sufficiently discussed elsewhere. And in this, in this case, I suppose we're talking about overpopulation as being central to the environmental problems. It's something that no politician will ever talk about. You're absolutely right about that. You said in the novel, it's something that, um, apart from the extreme deep greens, any mainstream politician keeps a million miles away from. Um, and yet, even even in this book, the characters discussing it are hugely sort of morally challenged as they do so. Were you consciously thinking this this is actually something we ought to be talking about as a society? And I would like to use um, the novel as one way of of launching it into public discourse. Novels are a machine for me for taking people I find lovable and putting them in the most uncomfortable possible situations. And I do that uh, in, in their emotional lives, but also I have, I have an interest in taking issues that really are intractable but central, such as the limits to growth, something that n- no politician except the, on the far fringes is able to deal with, uh, no economic theory is able to deal with. Uh, and... So yes, yeah, certainly overpopulation is is as intractable a problem and as untouchable a problem as there is, and and that was part of the program to mm. to, to 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 drive my characters to dramatic heights. Yes, it reminded me a bit of Wendell Berry, I don't know if you're the great American um, economist and tobacco farmer and <clears throat> Kentucky writer who who deals with this in 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 very similar circumstances to West Virginia. Anyway, what did the rest of us make of this, Barry? Yes, I I was kind of struck not by it being the great American novel, which I know you don't like, but I, for, for me it was much more like Greek tragedy. You know, you, you had a feeling of these characters rushing to an inevitable end. You sort of see the ineluctable forces that are going to bring about their destruction. And I'm also interested that the beginning of the book opens with something like a chorus. Mm-hmm. You have people sort of talking about the characters, and if I'm right and I'm on to you, I think that every character gets introduced by somebody else's description of them as if we're always eavesdropping on what somebody else thinks of them, which is a very powerful way of making us pay attention. So there's a sort of Greek drive here, and of course, just as the Greeks did, they take inevitable events and then try to make them sensible to the the general populace, not because they give an explanation, but they just sort of dramatise it and say, look, this is how things are. Yeah, you want an experience, right. and that's and 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 the, the novel is not a soapbox. It's uh, it's it's a way to provide an experience. It's a way primarily for the writer to have an experience and to figure out how to write it, and then um, equally primarily, but next in time for readers perhaps to sh- share that experience. Mm-hmm. Well, 
I, I, going back to freedom, I, I was interested in the way that the the title seems to hang over the novel like like a promise or like a threat and sometimes a bit like a curse and the way in which that that term is is tugged this way and that by different characters and, and different situations so it becomes increasingly unclear whether it's a question of freedom from something or freedom to do something um, and it struck me that there's that moment towards the end of the novel um, when Walter talks about uh, the internet and cable TV and says there's no communal agreement there's just a trillion little bits of distracting noise we can never sit down and have any kind of sustained conversation and I, I wonder whether you thought that's what the novel was for whether, whether, whether the case that, for the novel it's exactly <laughs> yeah. that, that's what this novel is for especially it, it is it, it, it reflects sustained conversation and it invites that kind of conversation as well um, I would be hard pressed to disagree with that wonderful reading. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. It's uh, we, we are we are trying to to, to fashion these uh, these large narratives in which you can take some sort of haven uh, from that daily noise for for however long it takes to read it and and to have to to, to be restored to the sense that there is my, there is the possibility of meaning in a world that seems increasingly resistant to anything more than momentary flickers of meaning. Well, except that there is a great thirst for this, this sort mm. of thing. I mean, you know, you look at... Apparently, yes, and it's it's been incredibly heartening. I, yeah. um, I was not looking forward to the U.S. tour, and I came off it feeling perversely almost optimistic uh, about... based precisely on the evident hunger for a certain mm. kind of sustaining narrative. Mm. Sheila? I think what I found interesting about the whole idea of this as being the great American novel, because where I, I completely agree that it's a distraction for a writer, but it's a r huge inhibition for a reader. And you've, you've no freedom as a reader. You pick up a paper and it says, the great American novel. And it means that you read it in a very difficult way, because your brain is completely split between wanting to enter into this I narrative, know, know. and the other bit of your brain thinking... Mm -hmm. Um, crikey, I'm not. Is, is there a theme here? Have I got a ho have I got the wrong theme? And it's a terrible thing to do to readers, as much as it is to do to writers. I think. Um, no, I <laughs> uh, couldn't agree with you more. It's um, I'm, I'm at pains to to. I, I really have at several points uh, in front of audiences just shouted out literally. It's just a novel. It's yeah. just a novel. But you can't have get it out of your head once it's there. You well, know. The, the title. What I suppose. Um, if you take the great out, what a lot of um, well-made American novels do, which you don't find so often, I think, in British novels or continental novels, is they have an intense sense of physicality. We were talking about Henry Mayhew's life, uh, London Labour and the London Poor, earlier on, which is a very, you know, it, it's a book of smells and, and, and tastes and clinks and chinks and physical stuff. And... In your novel, and this is why I do think of some America, uh, other American uh, writers like like Bellow and Updike and, and indeed Roth, there is a very strong sense of the material um, presence of characters. You know, what one knows as a reader exactly what your characters look like, how they walk, um, their three dimensionality, their their sort of heft, um, the way they sit, um, as well as the details of of, of what they're actually doing. And you build up a very strong material world around them. And I wonder whether that's uh, something that you consciously do or whether it's, it's about how you envisage the characters in your mind before you start writing. I actually don't have a... I could not tell you how at least one of the main characters looks. I don't know what the, the main female character looks like. <gasps> oh, I do. Oh, oh, well, I'm glad, I'm glad you do. We, 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 have, we have her height, but that's about all we have of her. Um, but... Uh, the, the, to, to me, it really goes back to um, to wanting before I even start writing to feel that I love the characters and that the, and, 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 and and that the book is primarily character driven rather, rather than idea driven. It's uh, there's a certain kind of intimacy, and I don't know if that's particularly American. Um, you certainly find it in the Russians as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and 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 who knows why that is? I, it could be when you have sort of empire-sized states at some remove from the rest of the world. Um, uh, With your character Walter, the, the good character, I was very strongly reminded of Pierre Betsukov in War and Peace. Actually, I thought they, the, 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 again you have this business of of the the fascinating, compromised man who's trying to be good. 
Um, there I will, yeah, no. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Enough of that. <laughs> Barry. I, I wanted to come back to your optimism about people liking the narrative and the search for meaning, because in some way that's good, and in other ways it's likely to be um, a sort of false friend, because, you know, Sheila's play takes this up. We do search for narrative, we look for narratives, but the narratives are often fictions. They're convenient fictions that we have about ourselves. We disguise from ourselves some of the things that make us up and some of the things we depend on. And, uh, and a crisis in and, life and is a crisis because, is, is you, because have you, you have your to rewrite story. your own story. And also yeah. because things pop out, things come through that you weren't seeing. And in your characters, you know, it's very satisfying that we see them in this position, but they don't have freedom. I mean, the title Freedom's Ironic. Most of them are not free at all. They're, you can see the crisis coming from, you know, from 100 miles because of their choices, their characters, their backgrounds, all the things that constrain them. And even though they're telling themselves a story that it's all uh, up to them and that they can decide, it looks to me that they can't decide at all and they just don't know themselves. I think they do come to know themselves. I, uh, you know, After the, the fact, though. Well, the, the owl of Minerva does fly at dusk. Um, the, 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 the philosopher I go back to over and over is Nietzsche and, and the, the notion that, that the mask, and the, and the narrative is a kind of mask, mm -hmm. That there's really there's 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 nothing underneath, mm -hmm. um, and you, you, the, the, my resistance, my support of narrative has to do with this fact that uh, things quickly so re reduce so quickly to to nothing. But we now know there is something underneath, and neuroscience is actually better at that than you think it is. I mean, you're a little bit out I, of date. I think about ten years out of date. I would have agreed with you, but now we do know a lot of what's going on underneath. Uh, we know what's going on under, underneath. I'm not sure it, it, it helps us to live our lives better. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. There's been a nasty flutter in the room. The Owl of Minerva has now left, and we've run out of time. Thank you to all my guests today. You can hear Barry Smith's science, a series on neuroscience, the mysteries of the brain, on BBC World Service. And there's a link on the Start of the Week website. Sheila Stevenson's play, Enlightenment, is on at the Hampstead Theatre in London until the end of October. Robert Douglas Fairhurst's edition of Henry Mayhew's London Labour and the London Poor and Jonathan Franzen's new novel Freedom, duly corrected, are both out, as they say, in all good bookshops now. Next week, we're at the Cheltenham Literary Festival, where we'll be discussing history in all its guises through the literature of Bernard Schlink, author of The Reader, and Sebastian Fawkes through the lives of a war hero with Peter Snow, and how history is abused with Margaret Macmillan. But for now, thank you and goodbye.